All right, welcome back to On the Tape. I'm here joined by the founder and managing partner of Space Capital. That would be Chad Anderson. Chad, welcome to the Off the Tape edition of On the Tape. Thanks. It's great to be here. Yeah. So we met through um, our fine partners at iConnections here. And it's really interesting. You know, Guy and I spend a lot of time talking to folks, trading, you know, public markets. We've done um, a lot of credit stuff this year, which is really interesting because that's something that's kind of bubbling up here a little bit. We talked to a lot of private market investors in the VC space, and a lot of them obviously have found their ways in and around some of the buzziest themes um, in the markets over the last few years. You know what they are. It's some Web3 stuff. It's some AR, VR. It's some gaming. It's uh, obviously now generative AI, that sort of thing. But you have built a firm, okay, on an area that I think is fascinating to most people, but they don't think about it from an investment standpoint, at least in the public markets, because there are not too many ways to do it. But Space Capital is an early stage uh, venture firm focused on something that you think is going to be a mega trend. You think that like in 10 years from now and on the tape, we are going to be talking about many, many publicly traded companies in and around this ecosystem, if you will, a little bit. So I want to talk about all that. We want to talk about your book, The Space Economy, Capitalize on the Greatest Business Opportunity of Our Lifetime. That's a catchy tagline, if you will. And we're going to talk about how you, our listener, can get a free copy of this book. So stick around um, for that, because I've been digging into it, and it's really fascinating. I love the fact that, yeah, there's some cool sci-fi stuff in there, but it really is about investing in this mega trend. Okay. So Welcome, Chad. Thank you. It's great to be here and um, great to be talking about one of the uh, topics that, you know, we are um, passionate about and see a lot of opportunity in. Yeah. So let's let's take a step back here because um, it looks like, you know, your LinkedIn is a mile long about the amount of companies that you were advising in the space. And obviously, those are companies that you've invested in and the like here. How did you get focused on this sector and how did you build a company in and around investing in it? And, and when you think about a venture firm, you have to go out and sell your expertise to investors to raise capital and let them believe that you see something that a lot of other folks don't, right? And that sort of thing. So let's talk about your background and how you got to the founding of Space Capital. Yeah. And so um, I didn't follow a, you know, sort of direct path. I was um, finance and economics undergrad and I have an MBA. Um, while I was at business school, I was studying under a great professor, Mark Ventresca, who I talk about in the book. He had a great influence on me. Um, he was, he teaches at Stanford and Oxford and he talks about nascent markets and how they develop, right? So think about the horse and buggy going to the automobile, um, the ice industry, you know, this happened many, many times throughout history that, um, a market is very limited and that's because there are high barriers to entry. Those barriers to entry are removed in floods, this wave of new entrants, entrepreneurship and innovation. And that's exactly what we've seen happen play out in space over the last decade plus. But back in 2012, it was all very new. So uh, SpaceX had just launched their first customer a couple of years before. That year, they launched the space station and did something that uh, only you know three uh, global superpowers had ever done before. And here, a private company was was doing it. So um, I was I, I recognized that the same things were playing out. So um, I kind of did the homework to understand, you know, is this a flash in the pan or is this actually like um, a structural change that's happening? Is this what, you know, we've seen in these countless other industries before? And the early data, you know, the data that I pulled together on investments, where it was going, who was investing, what were they investing in? All of that was compelling enough to me to decide that I was going to build a fund, you know, focused on this area. But back then, there wasn't enough deal flow or, or investor interest to support a fund. So I stayed in the UK, helped them stand up an innovation center that was focused on growing the space sector in the country, built out my networks, um, learned a lot about what was going on. And then I did that during the day. And then at night, I was hustling and building this fund on US hours. 2015, um, there's finally enough going on. I, I moved to New York and um, we launched our first fund. And back then, it was still... 
you know, there wasn't a whole lot of investors weren't tripping over themselves to invest in this category, right? It still was like very unknown and very new. Well, think, let's just take a step back. Yeah. So in, in 2012, Facebook had just gone public, right? Twitter was ready to go public. I mean, it seemed like if you were an adventure investor in the prior 10 years, right, between web 1.0, let's call it one, you know, 1. 1.5 or so, you were finally getting paid, right, on all those kind of social sorts of things. So it's funny when you think about the tech community from an investment standpoint, standpoint was focused on the things that fit on your iPhone for all intents and purposes and like, you know, connect yeah, you with people yeah. and help you buy things and post things and this and that, whatever. And you were looking out 10, 20 years ahead at that point. Yeah. I mean, um, again, and if you think about these, these massive sort of industry shifts, right. Um, they come along, you know, every so often you've got to be ready for it when it happens. And that's what I saw playing out. This is a monumental shift. I mean, today, um, there is no doubt that space technology is critical national infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, it is providing information to enterprises and governments. And in uh, uh, uncertain economic times like we're in right now, um, enterprises and governments want more information, not less. So all this data that's coming off these space-based assets is only becoming increasingly more important, um, more ingrained in our everyday lives. And it's the invisible backbone that powers our global economy. So this is a massive, massive opportunity. It's much more than just rockets and, and satellites. Yeah. So I, I want to hear about that a little bit too, because obviously there's some folks who, who made big bets on rockets, reusable rockets, and the satellite thing seems massive. You know, I, last year on the pod, we had Kevin Wheel from um, Planet Inc. Um, you know, on, and we were listening a little bit about, I mean, like every time I talk to somebody who's like in, you know, deep in the space sort of, you know, ecosystem. I'm just fascinated at the level of development, like how many satellites are going up every day to enable all of these different processes down here. And I think it's one of those things that I think most investors are just really not focused on whatsoever, because this is all happening underneath, you know what I mean? Um, you know, below the, the, above the surface, but really below, I, I think from an investment standpoint, because there's not a whole heck of a lot of ways for everyday investors to participate a, a bit. And so I want to talk a little bit about that, but let's go back to on your Twitter. It's your pinned tweet. This is you meeting King Charles in in July, and it's some space event there. So you you obviously, you went to Oxford, okay, right? So what, what is the connection? Because I don't think people think of, um, you know, England or the United Kingdom as a leader in space. And just this morning, we're recording this on Wednesday morning, I got a, you know, uh, a notification that, you know, India has, has uh, like, you know, there's a lunar landing, and this comes days or, or maybe weeks after a Russian uh, lander was supposed to, like, like crash. And, and, and the and the language that they used, the the, the Russians used, um, you know, about the crash. I mean, crash is just a simple word in America. Maybe it just in the English language, it doesn't translate to Russian. But they had some other funny way of doing it. I mean, a lot of stuff's going on, but I don't think of uh, the English at the forefront of this. Or, or am I wrong? Maybe from an academic standpoint. No, I mean there are certainly shifting winds um, amidst the, the the national superpowers in space for sure. And um, yeah, India touched down literally like. It was 10 minutes before I walked down here to the yeah. studio. Um, so that just happened this morning. And that's a, Did you get all geeked up about uh, that? It's a, it's a big it? deal. Yeah, 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 it's huge. Yeah. And what's so interesting about that, too, is that um, India took, you know, they, they, they crashed on the moon several years ago. And this is their, you know, follow-up mission to that. And we were all pretty excited because I got really close last time. And so to see them, you know, we, we were all very excited and hopeful that they were going to get it this, this time. And so they took a, a measured approach, you know, they launched to the moon, they, they took their time, you know, got their spacecraft into orbit, you know, did some orbits first, and then like slowly went down to the surface. Mm -hmm. um, they launched like, you know, a couple months ago. And then Russia was in a race, right, to get there first. And so they took the more direct route. Mm -hmm. And they literally were like, they launched way later. Mm -hmm. And then they were trying to touch down a couple of days before India and beat them there which is strange, but okay, like national prestige is still plays into this. Um, this is their first mission that they launched in 50 years. And they basically went a straight shot, like straight to the moon, straight to the surface, and bang, they landed, you know, they, they crashed into it. So that's... What, what, what's driving this newfound interest in the moon? Like, you know, it's it, it, like, like, like I'm 50 years old, and I just remember, you know, growing up in the 70s and, you know, early 80s, um, you know, there was this fascination with, you know, NASA and what we were able to accomplish. And it was very much ingrained in the kind of Cold War sort of thesis, right? Like, if, if you will. But we just forgot the moon, you know what I mean? Like yeah. the moon, like, so why is it that... that 
that that every nation, you know, or, or major, you know, developed nations are rushing to get back to the moon 50 years on or so because um, it just seems kind of odd that we were able to do it with the technology that is, you know, I, I have 100x the technology in my iPhone than, than, than the landers that landed on it, right? So w- what's going on here with the moon? I mean, we haven't been back for 50 years, and it's so interesting to look at the U.S. space program and um, and look at how we, uh, well, the global space program, how we went from nothing in orbit to a satellite in orbit to a humans in orbit and spacewalking and then, you know, landing on the moon, and then we've been regressing ever since. And it's this kind of really interesting idea that technology, like we take it for granted that it's just going to continue, continually improve and improve upon itself, but it doesn't. Because of the law of entropy, like if you don't continue to nurture it, it will go away. We're right now, we are just realizing how the Romans made their concrete that was self-healing, you know, like, and, and this is old, you know, this is just, there's countless examples of technology that goes away if you don't, you know, stay on top of it and continue to nurture it. And that's what happened in the space program and uh, the U.S. space program. And we, I talk about it quite a bit in the book about the rise and fall and rebirth of U.S. space ambitions. Um, you know, understanding the American space program is really easy once you understand the, the secret code. And the secret code is political will. And there was a lot of political will back then. When, that, when we landed on the moon and we essentially won the space race, then all of that sort of motivation went away. Technology has advanced quite a bit. And so it's not the days of essentially shooting a cannonball towards the moon, which is like insane to think about how they did it with the technology of the day. Um, but what's really underpinning this new interest in the moon today is similar ambitions, right? Is that it's the ultimate high ground from a DOD perspective. Um, the U.S. and China are racing to um, uh, go to the moon, and they are both racing to the South Pole, where the Indians just landed. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason for that is because we have um, orbiting satellites that have um, found water ice deposits. Mm-hmm. And this is super important. On the South Pole, it basically gets sunlight all the time. So it's a source of power um, and energy. And then there's water ice deposits, which you can uh, harvest and split into oxygen and hydrogen, use for fuel, use for life support. So the idea is to um, set up a permanently crewed outpost on the South Pole of the moon, similar to the International Space Station, which has been in orbit for 20 years, right? But it'll be an outpost that's on the lunar surface. And you would just depressurize it? Is that what they do? I know this is some like sci-fi yeah. stuff. Like how does someone, like, because we've never had anybody other than in the space station, which is yeah, obviously rotating, over the, like actually spend time on, right? Like what's the longest an astronaut had spent time on the moon back, back then? Yeah, I mean, it was a very short period of time. This is going to be completely different. Yeah. yeah. And it'll be like a rotating crew. Like people, you know, they won't go and live there for years on end, you know, to be, to start. But, and actually we're not even going to start with humans. We're starting with robotic precursor missions. So all of this is being underpinned by NASA's Artemis program. And it is, uh, they have committed billions of dollars to, to establish this outpost. Um, robotic precursor missions are launching later this year and early next year. We've got two companies in our portfolio. One is um, a, a, a rover and infrastructure company that's launching uh, in five months from now. By the way, the title for um, first commercial uh, lander on the moon is still up for grabs. Mm-hmm. So we'll see. Um, and we've got another company um, that's Lunar Outpost. And then next year, we've got Astrobotic. Astrobotic is carrying NASA's largest um, uh, robotic payloads to the surface that are going to do the initial scouting. And then they've got plans to, to lay out infrastructure, right? Their lander lands. It unfurls its solar panels. It becomes a power station the first power station on the moon. It's got a comms link back to Earth and they've got a Wi-Fi capability. So any of their payloads that, are, that they're taking, then now they're the first telco on the moon, yeah. right? They have a, they're setting up um, a power grid you know, it took to, to, to harvest um, solar energy and also power, you know, the initial infrastructure on the moon. So they are going to be, you know, there's some really interesting robotic precursor missions in the lead up to humans. All right. So let's take a step back here because this is kind of interesting. If you think about like the, 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 the contractors that did all of those sorts of things on a tiny scale 50 years ago or in the 60s and the 70s in the lead up to, you know, like a lot of these big missions, they were like Raytheon. There were these massive, right? Like, like companies here. These are all VC backed companies, right? That uh, like, you know, for the most part that you just described here. So these are smaller private companies that have taken venture capital to, to kind of get to the moon for all intents and purposes, right? So when you think about that, I mean, are you seeing levels of innovation that could not exist under-
under, let's say, the, the predecessor sort of like initiatives, that sort of thing. Because and, and, and I guess SpaceX is the perfect example in a way when you think about like the, the kind of um, advancements they were able to make here. Um, it might have taken a bit longer if that was under a government program working with a government contractor. Yeah, that's exactly what's going on here. I mean, never underestimate what um, just lower cost and easier access will do to stimulate innovation. Um, That's why India is able to do uh, what they were able to do this morning and why many other countries are setting up space agencies and why there is so many new entrants and so many new companies innovating and, you know, innovating with technology and innovating with business models is because um, SpaceX has done exactly that. NASA spending billions of dollars on their lunar missions. Um, the Indian Space Agency apparently was spending, I think they spent $75 million on this mission. It's insane to think about. So are they working with a lot of like private entities? And you use the, fir- the, the term efficiency. I mean, the whole idea is if you are, um, you know, a private venture back from is like you don't have unlimited capital. You have to be right. So like you, you, you have to be more efficient in how you deploy that capital. Yeah, I mean, look, the, SpaceX is, there's a lot of fascination with SpaceX and for good reason. The only reason we're even talking about space as an investment category is because of SpaceX, right? We've been operating in space for decades, um, but it has been a, before SpaceX, it was a very, very limited market. On the one hand, you had, you know, NASA um, government on, on one side as the sole customer. And on the other side, you had a handful of defense contractors and that was it. Very limited market, very high barriers to entry. SpaceX came in and with their initial launch, they significantly lowered the cost of getting to orbit. Um, they increased access and made it easier to, I mean, they just published it on their website. You could buy a launch on their website and suddenly there wasn't any black box, you know, of the cartel that was p- previously pricing this based on whatever they felt like, you know, it was $60 million. So you could buy a launch, right? And then brokerage services came in and were like, oh, hey, can we just buy the whole thing and then divvy it up? And also they published their pricing and suddenly you could launch a small satellite for $250,000, right? Um, and so this really changed the game, right? They removed those barriers to entry. And we've now seen over the last 10 years, we've seen um, $280 billion of investment capital into the space economy. Um, and put that's that in across con- 1,800 companies. Put that in some context here, if we think about this, because right now, $280 billion, okay? And this is, you know, like the, the funny thing about space is it literally is an unlimited TAM, right? If you think about it, right? So it's very different. Like when you look at, you know, kind of terrestrial sort of businesses, you can model out a whole host of things, how many people there are on the planet, how many have access to, you know, Wi-Fi or, or you know, like... I, you know, high, 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 you know, you, you get it, right? Um, so the the thing about space is it's literally unlimited, right? Like we we don't know what what the like the long tails of this sort of thing are. You know, you you mention this um, in 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 the book, the space economy, and I think this is really interesting that ninety percent of the value from the space economy comes from satellites. Okay, so so that's kind of like the gateway drug, if you will, to the space economy. Like, try to put some context around that right now, the, the amount of launches that are happening and what that opens the door for. What is the the things that you guys are investing in, in such an early stage that you see like that, you know, investors who listen to this are going to have access to these sorts of end markets in the not so distant future from, a, from an investment standpoint? Yeah, I mean, when most people think about space, they think about all the things we've been talking about, the Apollo moon landings, the International Space Station, like these grand human achievements, right? Um, but what people normally don't think about is um, the technology that is underpinning the world's largest industries, multi-trillion dollar industries today. It is the invisible backbone of the world's largest industries. And so if you kind of divvy up that 280 billion, right, you've got 9% of that is going to launch. um, uh, And you've got uh, uh, 1% going to what we call emerging industries. This is like lunar transportation, um, logistics in orbit, understanding where debris is, cleaning it up, that sort of thing, manufacturing. A lot of the stuff that the media likes to talk about, it makes up 1% of the overall value in the space economy. So this is interesting, fun to talk about. There are some opportunities, but 90% of the value in the space economy today comes from satellites. GPS Geospatial intelligence, satellite communications. GPS is the most advanced. It has already generated trillions of dollars in economic value and some of the largest venture outcomes that we've ever seen. 
So we think that GPS provides a playbook for how new investment opportunities are going to be created. GPS was built by the government for the government and military purposes, no doubt. I mean, it was actually um, off limits to anyone else by design until companies like Trimble, Garmin, and others built these commercial receivers to receive the signal and make it really easily accessible to the tech community, who then built applications on top of, of, of this really valuable signal. And that's location-based services, like the bread and butter of the mobile industry and everything that we use and all of the apps that, that, that powers all of our daily behaviors and all of enterprise today is location-based services. This is a massive TAM. Um, we're talking in the T trillions of dollars of TAM for positioning services, right? And this is only getting better. Like we are improving the GPS signal um, through hardware and software, and it's unlocking new applications in um, uh, autonomy. Uh, autonomous vehicles are going to rely on this. Um, s- the era of spatial computing with Apple and its new headset is powered by precise positioning and also geospatial intelligence. Like think about it, if GPS is the dot on the map, you know, geospatial intelligence is the map. And we've gone from, you know, hand-drawn maps to then digital information overlaid on top of these maps. And we're now moving to a place where we've got mixed reality in this era of spatial computing where we're overlaying digital information on top of the physical world. All of this is is underpinned by space technology as well. And then you've got satellite communications. Satellite communications has been around for a long time. But what's happening now with SpaceX and their Starlink satellites and Amazon and their Project Kuiper... They're launching um, massive constellations of low Earth orbit satellites that are connecting the most remote places on the planet. And they're doing it at bandwidth and latency and cost that that uh, competes directly with fiber, which is crazy. And so but you're getting in in like soon you are going to be able to go wherever you want in the world, camping, hiking on your backpacking trip um, through Bhutan and you're going to have full bars. Like you're not even going to think about it. And that unlocks all kinds of new applications. All the stuff that we were just talking about. Autonomy need to be connected. Crews just had half of their vehicles pulled off the road because they lost connectivity, right? Um, But if you think about um, uh, uh, mission critical um, operations, remote operations, mining, Aquaculture, um, you know, war. You on- well, so so here's the here's one I want to go be, to, right? And this was there's a fa- I'm sure you read this. It was the New York Times last month. It was uh, Elon Musk's unmatched power in the stars. Okay, and it was really talking about Starlink. It was talking about the influence that he has over Star, the influence that he has over the largest shooting war that we've had. Uh, okay, in in, in um, Europe, obviously since World War II. And so I find it pretty fascinating. And this is one where if if this is a really nascent industry, then we haven't really defined um, regulation. We haven't defined global cooperation. You know, like there's a whole host of things that are going to happen. When you think about how large the stakes are to all the examples that you just gave, I feel like this is going to be, this is going to be the biggest issue in the near term is where the power is consolidated. One man, right, has all the voting rights to a $140 billion company, which is SpaceX, which is sending, you know, rockets, it seems, you know, every month up to the space station. It's reliant on government contracts. It's a, it, it has a lot of obviously sway with the, the private economy. Um, they have 4,500 satellites. This is Starlink up. You know, I think that's the most, right, of, of obviously easily, without, a doubt. without a doubt. And they keep sending them up. So think about how this one man can be influenced by nations, right, by, um, you know, powerful private sector influences, that sort of thing. It seems like this is like the Bond villain of all Bond villains, if, if you will. Like if you think about every Bond villain, they have some plan to do this and they have some interest here and there and that sort of thing. How does he go unchecked, if you will? Because this article goes into great length how he turned on Starlink, okay, over Ukraine, and that's helped their military capabilities dramatically, but he won't allow it to be over Crimea, which is what Russia, you know, suggests that they um, control based on, um, you know, their invasion 10 years ago, that sort of thing. And it's just kind of interesting to me, this man has control over those satellites, which can kind of, it could actually um, dictate the future of 
of Europe, if you think about it. So talk to me a little bit about that. Like, do you guys spend a lot of time thinking about that? Because I'm sure you are invested in companies that are doing state of the art stuff. They're trying to keep under wraps for the most part. And they obviously their success could have a lot to do with like public market Im- implications, you know what I mean? Or, or, you know, or very private ones, you know what I mean? That like, um, y- you know, intelligence agencies first here, but also abroad are going to be very interested in. Yeah, I it's mean, a lot there, a lot, no, lot, lo- lot there. Loaded question here, and I know you you have to be careful as you think about this as somebody who is, um, you know, s- you invested in all different parts of this. And SpaceX, I'm sure, is probably a great partner to a lot of companies, or likely could be an acquirer, or could be a whole host of things for companies in your portfolio. I mean, the Russian invasion of Ukraine was a a put a spotlight on the growing capabilities of commercial space companies, without a doubt. It was SpaceX's Starlink satellites that kept them connected. Um, and it was companies like um, Earth Observation Companies, um, some of which are in our portfolio, that were providing a ground truth of what was actually happening on the ground. So Russia would come out and say, hey, we did this. And everyone would be like, yeah, no, you didn't, because we're looking at pictures. And that's not Real what time happened. time as these satellites are going right over. That's right. Yeah. It's really changed the game. Like we have, and that's what I you know, said earlier, that there's that it's all about data from orbital assets. It gives us this unique global perspective, unique global connectivity, um, an ability that we've not had before at a, at a pace and a revisit rate and like in a timely timeliness um, in, a, in a way that we've never had before. Um, at the moment, SpaceX is the only game in town. They're the only game in town when it comes to launch. They're the only game, you know, they're the only game in town when it comes to Starlink. And they've done a lot of good. Like I said, you know, the NASA uh, program was sort of, you know, was in decline. We had peaked and we were now sort of like, you know, riding off into the sunset. It's SpaceX that came in with, um, that is enabling NASA to do more with limited budgets, right? It, 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 SpaceX has pushed us farther in the last 10 years than... And, yeah, and, but limited budgets, but without the contracts from, from the government, you know what I mean? They don't have the revenue coming in and the mission. You know, like, like to me, I just think it's kind of really interesting because, yeah, they've basically just, you know, kind of, you know, stealing from Peter to pay Paul over here. And they've created a situation where, you know, Elon is now the richest man in the world, both from the, the subsidies and the contracts that he's gotten from not just, you know, SpaceX, but also Tesla. And I guess one of the things that I, I guess I'm just most focused on, and again, I'm not trying to get you to opine on it one way or another, but we have a situation where the richest man in the world has control over some of the most important assets on the planet. And just to use a Russian phrase, what if there's a little compromise here? You know, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's a really dangerous situation, in my opinion, which makes him probably the most dangerous person on the planet. Yeah, I mean, look, they, NASA has wants to do some things and they don't have the money to do it. Right. The only, like they put it out to bid. They put it out to industry and everyone bids on it. SpaceX is the only one that won the human lander, you know, initially program to land NASA back on the moon because they were the only ones that could do it within the cost constraints. So in launch, but they're not doing this in a vacuum. They live stream everything, yeah. right? So like other people can compete with them. Yeah. It would be great if others did, you know, on the launch side. Um, on the, the satellite uh, communication side, Amazon Kuiper is um, far along in development. It'll be great when there's more competition in launch and in SATCOM. Um, when Amazon Kuiper comes online, that's going to be a, um, a similar but different capability um, that is going to give customers some options. We're in a situation right now where um, uh, Russia and China are snipping um, undersea cables, right? That's a real concern for places like Taiwan. Um, Taiwan is concerned about um, Elon's ties with China. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be reliant on Starlink because they're seeing what's happening in Ukraine, exactly like you just mentioned. And they're saying in a, you know, when, when it hits the fan, we don't want to be in a situation when we're, when we're, where we are reliant on somebody who has done this sort of thing in the past. So will Kuiper help with that? Probably. There's also some regional players, some newer venture backed players that have regional satellites that sit, you know, in geostationary or- orbit, which means that it just, it rotates with the earth and stays over one point, provides connectivity. There, there is competition coming and that'll be very welcome. 
It can't, it can't come fast enough because the point about Elon is, is multifold. You think about he bought Twitter for $44 billion in the name of free speech, but yet he cozies up to the most totalitarian regime on the planet because he wants access to not just their manufacturing in China for Tesla vehicles, but also rare earth materials for their batteries. And he also wants access to this rising middle class that is buying lots of EVs, right? And then you, you know, the other point is Starlink with Taiwan. And, and I mean, it's a really complicated case that doesn't end particularly well, I think, you know what I mean, um, for Elon. So the competition um, can't come fast enough. All right, let's talk a little bit um, uh, before we get out of here, Chad. And this is, we could, I think we could talk for hours. I'm sure you're probably the most interesting guy um, at most cocktail parties here because no one really gives a crap what I think about uh, this market or that market or this or whatever, not at a cocktail party. Everyone loves talking about this stuff because in our lifetimes, if you think about all the stuff that we grew up as far as sci-fi, except the Star Wars stuff, a lot of it's like, actually happening right now. You're investing in companies that may sound sci-fi to, to, to kind of normies right here, but you are fairly well convinced a lot of the technology that they're working on right now in 20 or 30 years might be something that we all become you know, very um, used to or, or relying on that sort of thing. So talk to us a little bit um, about your strategy at Space Capital. And also, like again, you know, a lot of our listeners, they might have the ability to invest in a venture fund, that sort of thing, but are, are there going to be more, um, are, are there going to be some vehicles in which a, a lot of, um, you know, everyday investors are going to have access to, because again, if this is one of the biggest opportunities in technology over the next, you know, 20 years or so, it seems that there better be an opportunity for investors to get early access as like some of your LPs have in space capital. Yeah, I mean, where we are today is, you know, our tagline is that in the same way that every company today is a technology company, every company of tomorrow will be a space company. And what we mean by that is that, you know, in the 90s, there was, it was technology was new, right? There was a handful of technology stocks and you could diversify your portfolio into technology, right? But that moniker like has lost all of its meaning because technology is ubiquitous in everything that we do. And the same thing is happening um, with space technology today. So, um Think about where we are in the development of all this, right? SpaceX launched their first customer a little over a decade ago, um, and they didn't really even like build up their their launch cadence. They started uh, landing rockets and really removing uh, more cost, um, increasing accessibility in 2015. Google um, and Fidelity put a billion dollars into SpaceX in 2015. That was a big year that started to see um, uh, you know a lot of a lot of increase. And so if you look at that, we're you know, seven, six, seven years into this, when you're making investments into early stage companies, um, it takes six to eight years for those companies to go through the normal sort of process of growth and be ready for the public markets. Um, so it's coming. We're nearly there. It's pretty exciting. You know, this conversation is more to see sort of like what's coming down the pipe. We're investing at seed. We're investing. We're the first check into these companies. And this is sort of a leading indicator um, to public markets about where things are going. But now we're we're to a point where a lot of that stuff's going to be coming on to the public markets, I think, when this next IPO window opens. And it seems like it's slowly starting to crack open now with some with some more listings. And so we'll see. But um, look, what is available, like the trick here in our, um, in our strategy is to think about this in its totality, right? If I was just to go out and invest in a bunch of infrastructure companies, launch and satellite hardware and these emerging industries, that would be a very uninteresting portfolio from an ROI perspective. Why would you build, do all of the hard stuff, all the heavy CapEx, you know, long timelines to revenue? Why would you do all of that hard work and then not capitalize by investing in the distribution of that data and in the applications that are built on top of it? That's what we're focused on is this, is this broader opportunity. And when you think about it through that lens, you know, um, you can start to get some really interesting uh, names. Like if you talk to John Deere, they leverage space technology in a major way. Um, autonomous tractors today look like get like if you go inside of it, it looks like the inside of a cockpit of like a shuttle, of a space shuttle, right? They and and they're not shy to talk about it. They are they are a space an application of space technology in agriculture. Um, Nvidia is you know the talk of the town at the moment, right? Um, and they make we wrote about this in one of our thesis papers, the GeoInt playbook. In, in the late 90s, they made GPUs, 
graphic processing units widely accessible, which is basically giving rise to all of these AI applications today um, and, you know, across gaming and across enterprise and everything else. Um, NVIDIA is another great name that is powering everything in the space economy from like um, uh, design to operations, you know, to, to, to everything else. Um, and so there are ways to participate in this if you think about it holistically. And that's what I talk about in the book is like, let's, okay, you know space, right? But you're probably thinking it's this. Like it's a much, much bigger opportunity. When you start to tie those, those dots together, you start to see how big this opportunity can be. And here is a playbook for how you can start thinking about deploying. Well, it's interesting just, just thinking about AI and the fascination in the public markets in just the last nine to 10 months and think about how many trillions of dollars in market cap have actually been created. And it is a trillion. I mean, like if you think about how much market cap NVIDIA has gained just on the excitement in and around the applications of their GPUs and what Microsoft did and what Google did and, and, and the like here, um, you, you dig into the space economy, the book, you're, you're not talking about just the stuff that's the landers and all the, the kind of sexy sci-fi stuff. It's a lot of everyday applications and how it's going to work its way into it. And, and I'll just say this is like, you mentioned the thesis paper. If you go to spacecapital.com under the insights that there's a lot, they're all there. There's a lot of educational stuff, a lot of great videos, um, a lot of great stuff with Chad and his partners. Um, so check that out. You can learn more about space capital there. And then the one thing, Chad, I'm just going to say before I get out of here, because I'm really enjoying this book. I think people should read it. If you're thinking about new themes and markets, you're kind of sick of the stuff that you've been focused on over the last, you know, let's call it 10 years or so. Um, we are going to give away a hundred books of the space economy capitalized on the greatest business opportunity of our lifetime. That's Chad Anderson's view right there. And he wrote a book about it. So all you have to do, and you know the drill here, people, email at contact at riskreversal.com. And Amanda, leave a review of the On The Tape podcast. Leave a review also of the OK Computer podcast podcast because we're going to put um, this conversation also on OK Computer here. We feel our listeners over there are going to love that too. Uh, take a screenshot of those reviews. Send them, Amanda. Contact at riskreversal.com and you're going to get a, a, a book here. So, Chad, thank you for being here of our Off the Tape segment on on the tape. Uh, great friend of iConnections here. They're a great sponsor of ours. Thank you for being here. Hope you'll come back. Yeah, thank you. Good to be here. <laughs> 